<clears throat> Dear friends, welcome to the Russian Ability Association's new virtual lecture and event series that will focus on themes in Russian history and culture, providing a fresh perspective and examining ways these events are used today to reshape the present. I am Alexander Niratov, Vice President of the Association. We start the series just a few days after the last ship left Crimea 100 years ago to start the white immigration journey that brought us here today. This will be the main theme of our next lecture in two weeks on December 5th. But today, we are honored by the presence of our friend, historian and best-selling writer, Douglas Smith, who has graciously agreed to inaugurate our series with a presentation of his new book, The Russian Job, The Forgotten Story of How America Saved the Soviet Union from Ruin, covering events that took place in the two or three years after the exodus from Crimea. Douglas Smith is an award-winning historian and the author of six books on Russia. His book, Former People, The Final Days of the Russian Aristocracy, was a bestseller in the UK. You would have heard about his 2016 biography, Rasputin, Faith, Power, and the Twilight of the Romanovs <clears throat> and the Pearl. Please join me in welcoming Douglas Smith. Thank you for that nice introduction, uh, Alexander. Uh, it's really wonderful to be back and to be able to uh, talk to everybody from the Russian Mobility Association. Um, I had the good fortune to do that a few other times, uh, talking about my books, The Pearl and, and Former People. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry we can't all be gathered in some nice place in, in New York uh, doing this face to face, but um, it's wonderful to nonetheless uh, have a chance to talk uh, about Russian history. And um, thank you, Alexander, for the invitation. Um, I want to thank the other panelists uh, joining me, which will be uh, fun to hear their perspectives and to exchange views. And um, I also need to thank the dynamic duo of the Galitsyns who uh, who handled all of the uh, technical things, uh, dealing with the uh, neophytes like some of us. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for, for tuning in today. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll move on to a broader uh, discussion and then look forward to taking everybody's uh, questions uh, uh, at the end. What I wanted to talk about today is, is something that I consider to be one of the, the noblest acts in American history, uh, an act that is uh, sadly largely forgotten. At its heart, it's a, a story of, of charity and compassion, two things that we always need more of, and I would argue two things that we especially need a lot more of today. On the 13th of July, 1921, the Russian writer Maxim Gorky issued an appeal to the world titled, To All Honest People. He wrote at the time, gloomy days have come for the land of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Mendeleev, Pavlov and Mussorgsky. Russia's misfortunes offer humanitarians a splendid opportunity to demonstrate the vitality of humanitarianism. I ask all honest Europeans and Americans for prompt aid to the Russian people. Give bread and medicine. In 1921, one of the worst famines in world history descended on Russia. 30 million people across a vast territory were facing starvation and death. It's estimated to have been as much as a quarter of the entire Russian population. Now, there were several causes for the famine. It was precipitated chiefly by two years of horrible drought in 1920 and 1921, some of the worst droughts that had been seen in, in 30 years that decimated the harvests. But one needs to obviously go back further in time to really get to the root causes of the famine. There were seven years, obviously, of, of unending war and revolution beginning with World War I in 1914, when millions left the lands to go off and fight the Germans and Austrians, followed by the two revolutions of 1917 that brought anarchy and chaos to the countryside, and then civil war from 1917 to 1920, as the Reds and the Whites and various other armies laid waste to the countryside and spread terror wherever they went. Now, Lenin, shown here, had long understood the link between power and food. In 1891, when famine hit Russia, again, a horrible famine, many an educated society, led by the example of Lev Tolstoy, offered help to the peasants, but not Lenin. 
Lenin did not believe in charity, but he thought only revolution, in fact, was what was needed to save the peasants. He said at the time, the overthrow of the Tsarist monarchy, this bulwark of the landowners, is their only hope for some sort of decent life or an escape from hunger and unending poverty. Hunger and misery, Lenin believed, would undermine the Tsarist state and thus lead to revolution. Now that Lenin and the Bolsheviks were in power, they began to wage a war against the Russian peasants. They forced them at gunpoint to hand over their grain to feed the cities and the Red Army. The peasants obviously resisted. They hid the grain in their fake walls of their huts, down in the well, or under bales of hay. And at times, they even fought back. This meant, however, that when the famine hit and the rains didn't come, there was no grain reserves for anyone in the country to fall back on. There was literally nothing left for people to eat. By March of 1921, Lenin was terrified that with no food, the Soviet state might lose the support of workers and the Red Army and quite possibly even collapse. He said at the time, quote, if there is a harvest, then everybody will hunger a little and the government will be saved. Otherwise, since we cannot take anything from people who do not have the means of satisfying their own hunger, the government will perish. Herbert Hoover, shown here, was born in West, West Branch, Iowa in 1874 into a family of Quakers. He was orphaned at the age of nine and moved off to Oregon to live with an uncle. In 1891, he enrolled in the first class at Stanford University and went on to graduate four years later with a degree in geology. Uh, based on all accounts that we have, he was the most average of student, uh, did not impress his professors or, or fellow classmates, none, none of whom held out great expectations for the young Herbert Hoover. He went off to work in the gold mines of Australia and from there then moved on to China. He quickly rose up the ranks of the international mining business. He had a rare talent, it turns out, as an administrator and he was able to find new opportunities and turn around failing mining operations and make money at them where others had failed. By 1914, he was living with his family in London and was now the head of his own international firm with offices around the world, including St. Petersburg. He had grown extremely wealthy, but he'd also become bored. The whole game of, of developing mines around the world sort of lost the excitement that it had once held for him. During World War I, he was tasked with creating what came known as the Commission for Relief in Belgium. The country invaded by the Germans was now at the risk of massive starvation and Hoover put together a re food relief operation that went on to feed millions of people in Belgium and in Northern France. And he became known as the savior of Belgium. By 1917, he was back in the United States and then President Woodrow Wilson made him the head of the US Food Administration based on his success in, in Belgium. In 1919, at the end of the war, Wilson was pushed by Hoover to create something known as the American Relief Administration with a grant of $100 million from Congress that was to be used to feed and rebuild war-torn Europe. Two years later, by 1921, Hoover was now Secretary of Commerce in the Warren G. Harding Administration. It was on July 22nd of that year that Hoover read in an American newspaper Gorky's appeal to the world for help. He immediately sprang into action and sent a cable to Gorky saying the Americans were ready to help. Hoover took the tens of millions of dollars that were still in the ARA coffers and then turned around and sought an additional $20 million from Congress for Russian food relief. Now, there were a good many people in the United States at the time who were against the idea of going over and feeding Russians. Some on the political left were convinced that Hoover, who was a well-known anti-communist, was really interested in fomenting counter-revolution and bringing down the Soviet government, not in fact in offering help. They insisted that the only way to truly help the Soviet state was to offer political recognition of the country so that the two could work together. Most of the criticism, however, came from the political right. Many insisted that, that what was really happening was not an attempt to go off and save Russia, but to give aid to American farmers who had produced too much and seen their prices drop. This was really, they thought, a sop to the US that had nothing to do with Russia. 
Others, like the notorious anti-Semite racist Henry Ford, insisted that the ARA was in fact a corrupt organization run by Jews and Bolsheviks out to help their own. Others insisted that if the Russians were starving, then it was only their own fault. It was due to the ridiculous decisions, their political maneuvering that had led to the civil war and had led to the famine, and then in fact, they ought to be left to starve to themselves as this was the best way to destroy and finally defeat Bolshevism once and for all. Hoover, however, insisted that whatever the politics, aid was necessary. He said at the time, quote, the sole object of relief should be humanity. It should not have any political objective or aim other than the maintenance of life and order. He did call Soviet Russia a murderous tyranny in his words, but he felt that the United States had a humane obligation to help whenever it could. What's more, he said the United States could easily afford the assistance, saying, quote, the American people spend a billion dollars a year on the things like tobacco, cosmetics, and what have you. I do not think asking for an additional $20 million is too much. In the end, the ARA would spend well over $50 million in its efforts to work and make Russia whole again. Now, the Soviets were also wary. Here's an example of just some of the grain that went over to Russia at the time. It's a picture of an ARA warehouse uh, in the New York City area. Now, just as there were voices uh, in the United States, both on the left and the right, that were, that were wary and critical of the notion of this big uh, relief operation, the Soviets obviously were extremely wary as well. Um, Lenin and the leaders of the Bolshevik party, as we obviously know, had led their revolution to overthrow world capitalism, to move uh, history forward, in their opinion, to communism. They were terrified of the idea of letting in what they would consider to be capitalist agents into the country. They viewed Hoover and his organization as some sort of a Trojan horse that presented itself as a gift, but would be certain to wreak havoc once inside. Lenin gave the Cheka, the secret police, strict orders that all of the Americans were to be kept under tight surveillance once they were inside the country. They would infiltrate the ARA and try to observe every last aspect and every last move it made from the inside. At the same time, even though they were extremely skeptical and wary about the Americans, Lenin knew that without American aid, the Soviet government itself stood a good chance of collapsing. Here's an example of just one of the first kitchens that was set up uh, in Russia, eventually see, feeding 2,000 children a day. Some of you obviously may recognize it. This is the Alexander Palace at Tsarska Silo with children lining up to be fed uh, by the Americans. Uh, it is said that one of the cooks in this kitchen actually was a former Romanov uh, kitchen servant. The first American men arrived in Russia on the 27th of August, 1921. On the 1st of September, the food first arrived in the Petrograd Harbor. And by the 6th of September, the first ARA kitchen had opened in Petrograd on the Moika. On the 10th of September, the first kitchen in Moscow was opened in the once fashionable Hermitage restaurant. Now the original plan was to feed a million children in Russia, but the Americans very quickly realized that the problem was much larger than they'd ever anticipated that the hunger was deeper and it spread much farther than anyone had any conscience of before they had arrived. And they knew that they would need to do a good deal more work than they had originally planned. And by December of 1921, they were already thinking of needing aid for 7 million children who if they did not get it, would not live throughout the winter. One of the Americans who was sent over was Frank Golder. And this is what he wrote after his first trip out into the famine zone. The famine is bad beyond all imagination. It is the most heartbreaking situation that I have ever seen. Millions of people are doomed to die and they're looking it calmly in the face. To see Russia makes one wish that he were dead. These are the kinds of scenes that Golder had encountered as he toured the famine zone. He was particularly disturbed by what he saw in one village, the sight of an old woman on all fours in the dirt fighting with a group of pigs over some small scraps of pumpkin rind. Here are some famine victims in Samara showing the utter destitution that much of the country had been reduced to. Golder even heard on his travels tales of mothers killing their children and then taking their own lives since they had nothing to feed them. 
Orphanages and hospitals were among the most horrific sites that the Americans encountered. Children's homes originally built for 30 or so little kids were now holding as many as 500. The conditions were beyond description. Often the children simply lay on the floor in rags. One of the ARA men who visited the orphanages said, there's just enough food and heat to make their death a slow one. After a few months in Russia, one ARA man wrote back to his fiance in New York City, quote, I often think now how people in New York told me how they envied me the opportunity of seeing so many interesting things. Yes, interesting, that's the word. Yes, it's very interesting to move among people who at a glance tells you would be better off dead than alive. There is no escape, even in this railway car, for men and women come to the door begging for bread and children can be heard whining beneath the car window whenever the light is showing. Many of the American men developed something that was known as famine shock, sort of a, a reinterpretation of World War I's shell shock. Their nerves destroyed, they often had to be sent out to the West to recuperate before being allowed back into Russia to continue the relief operations. First, the Russian peasants ate whatever grain they had. After that was all gone, then they would turn on their livestock to kill and eat. After that, they hunted down and killed every last dog and cat in the village. Then they tried to survive on grass, on weeds, tree bark, and even the thatch off the roof. Finally, in some horrible instances, peasants were reduced to cannibalism, either murdering their victims or in fact raiding cemeteries and bringing back freshly dead bodies to consume at home. The dead at one point had to be locked up in stables and sheds and barns to keep people from getting at them. Peterim Sorokin, the world famous sociologist from Russia who eventually ended up in the United States, toured the famine zone to get an idea of just what the Russian people were experiencing. And he saw many instances of cannibalism. He later wrote in a memoir, quote, the revolution promised to save the people from despotism. The Bolsheviki promised to give food to everyone. If they did not keep those vows, at least they gave the people the communion of human sacrifice, human flesh and blood. This is a drawing here on the screen that was done by a Russian named Molchanov, um, showing a Russian village uh, for February and March. There's no year there, but it's probably 1922. Um, that depicts just one example of, of cannibalism. There's a collection of Molchanov's uh, drawings like these at the Hoover Institution Archive at, at Stanford, um, in which he chronicled uh, the horrors uh, of the famine during these years. One thing that's sort of interesting, especially for, for English speakers, is that the word on the, on the right there, a lot of you can probably read that, uh, it says Lurdietstva, um, it's interesting, in Russian, there's two words for cannibalism, unlike in English. Ludoyetstva uh, means people eating. Uh, and then there's also another word the Russians had, trupoyetstva, which means corpse eating. They made a distinction between whether one actually killed someone to eat them or if one ate a body that was already dead. Now, from the very beginning after the Americans arrived, it became obvious that their notion of the scope of the famine was wholly inaccurate and incomplete. And as a result, the size of the mission they went over to carry out grew and grew over the two years that they were there. Now you'll sometimes hear this famine of 21 to 23 referred to as the Volga famine or the Pavorje famine. And it's actually not at all correct. The famine was much bigger and more broad sped than the Volga region. This is a map that was done by the ARA at the time that shows the shaded areas that they were working in and just how extensive it was. By the end of the operation, they had covered over a million square miles of territory, extending all the way from Western Ukraine, where something like 9 million people out of a population of 26 million were starving, all the way east out into the Ural Mountains, south into the Caucasus in Dagestan um, and into the northern stretches uh, of the Caspian region. It was an enormous job, an enormous challenge, as you can imagine. One of the biggest difficulties the Americans faced was transportation. 
was figuring out how they were going to move the grain from the ports, both in the Baltic and in the Black Sea, out into the regions where the people needed the food. Obviously, the railway system had largely been destroyed as a result of World War I, and then especially the revolution and civil war. The railroads that were still functioning were often attacked by bandits and thieves, um, and much of the railway system did not even get out into the most remote villages where aid was especially necessary. Um, as a lot of you probably know, the spring season was almost impossible to move due to the Rasputitsa when everything became so muddy that the roads were impossible and uh, the villages were almost like isolated cut off islands to which no one could gain access. Now in typical American fashion uh, and, and in typical maybe American ignorance of other countries, the ARA just assumed that they would be driving around all of Russia delivering aid and they sent over a large number of Cadillac touring cards and Fords and very quickly realized that these uh, were not gonna be of much use to them and typically these these vehicles remained in Moscow or Petrograd and only a few of them made it out into, into the countryside. There was one American who was sent off deep into, into the Ural Mountains and he kept going further and further east, hoping to find an end to the family. And he finally came up with the, with the view that he could have gone all the way to China and it would have made no difference in the amount of hunger and misery that he encountered. This is an example of, of just how uh, the grain was moved. This is a, uh, a food train using camels, uh, making its way through uh, Tsaritsa and now, now Volgograd on its way out into the, into the remote villages. Obviously winter was probably the best time to be moving grain since with sledges and sleighs, they could get across these vast expanses much better than they could in the spring or summer months even. There was about 380 or so Americans who worked for the ARA uh, Russian operation, but there was never more than 200 of them in the country at any one time. And obviously there was no way they could logistically handle all the work that needed to be done. So one of the first things the Americans did when they got there was to hire Russians to do the vast bulk of the actual relief operation. And over time, they put together an army of something like 125,000 Russian employees who were used to actually get the food out into the countryside and to see the kitchens were set up where the children and others could be fed. Here's an example of sort of what conditions were like uh, out, outside the uh, cities of Moscow and, and Petrograd. This is the main street in Kazan taken uh, on a uh, day in early May of 1922, to give you an idea of just how difficult it would be to sort of move around in all this. Life was obviously very grim throughout much of the country, especially once you got outside Moscow and Petrograd. Living conditions were rustic to, uh, to, to say the least. Um, and many of these cities were in fact quite, quite dangerous. One of the first things the Americans did when they got out into these uh, towns and cities was to make sure that they had a gun. The Cheka was willing to allow the Americans to cut, carry guns with them because getting back and forth from their personnel houses where they lived to the offices where they worked was often dangerous. There were numerous instances of them being attacked. They learned to always walk down the middle of the street so that they had a better chance of getting a jump on anybody who was running out to attack them um, and they could draw their gun and fire back. There were also various uh, attempts at burglary in the personnel houses. Uh, and in one instance, uh, there was even an attempt to burn the Americans down uh, as, they, as they slept. So on one hand, they had to worry about uh, bandits and thieves. On the other hand, the Americans had to worry about the Chica agents who tried to put spies into the American offices to keep an eye, uh, sort of close watch on all that they were doing and often would come in and arrest the Russians that were working for the Americans and charge them with being spies. The biggest threat, however, that the Americans faced was disease specifically typhus. There was inf infected lice and fleas uh, throughout all the railway cars, um, throughout much of the clothing that people were wearing. And it was this, it was this threat of being bitten by an inf infected flea or, or louse that was the greatest, the greatest threat to everybody. When the Russian couriers would arrive, 
before being allowed into the American offices, they had to stand outside and a group with brushes would go out and literally brush them from head to toe, trying to make sure that they were clean before they were allowed in. Some of the Americans talked about how horrible it was when they would visit the orphanages to see these, these just waifish little dying children and wanting to hold them and pick them up and touch them, but knowing they didn't dare for fear of coming down with typhus. Now, mission creep quickly took over for the ARA. Feeding people, it became obvious fairly quickly, would not be enough. That they also would need to be attacking the sort of social breakdown, uh, physical health breakdown on multiple fronts. They decided that they were gonna have to fight typhus and cholera, smallpox and malaria. So they went around setting up um, mobile clinics. They outfitted a hospital train that traveled all over Russia dispensing with free medical care. Um, the most basic of supplies were gone from Russian hospitals. Aspirin was not to be found. Bandages were gone. They were actually using old newspapers and things like that for bandages. So the ARA started to import millions and millions of dollars worth of supplies to stock Russian hospitals and clinics. The Americans set up their own dental clinics. Um, they brought in vaccines, drugs, disinfectants, blankets, what have you, the most basic of things. This is a photograph of uh, an American run clinic in Petrograd where the children are being inoculated against various diseases. They even set up water purification systems in a number of cities to try to tamp down the various cholera outbreaks. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures that I came across uh, in the archive. This is a group of children in Odessa who have just come from uh, one of the ARA kitchens and they've been given new clothes and new shoes. You see they, they're, they're carrying their old shoes in their hands and they have these uh, very stiff leather looking uh, shoes that they've uh, been given by the Americans. And what's interesting is the clothing they're wearing uh, is in fact repurposed grain sacks. So the grain that came over from America was then repurposed, retooled, and sewn into trousers and tunics and dresses for, for young Russians so they didn't have to go around in the rags they would have been wearing before. There was something like a half a million pounds of shoes and clothing that the Americans sent over. There was also a lot of relief effort that was directed at the Russian intellectual uh, and academic scholarly community. Now it's, it's hard, to, hard to conceive of in the days of the internet and everything, but as a result of World War I and then revolution and civil war, the Russian academic community was largely isolated and come, cut off from all of its peers working in Europe and the United States. And so they had no idea even what was happening in their particular fields. So the United States uh, offered special relief programs for teachers, scholars, artists, uh, for ballet dancers, for musicians and what have you, special feeding programs. And they even started shipping over the latest uh, scientific literature, journals, books, papers, publications. Um, they provided free subscriptions for Russian universities and institutions so that they could finally get caught up to speed on what was happening. This is just one of the, uh, the people that they helped, obviously. This is uh, Nobel laureate Pavlov in his laboratory in Petrograd with one of his obviously famous dogs. Now, it wasn't just all hard work. Um, the strain of trying to run the operation was overwhelming. And these young American men who went over to do that obviously needed to blow off steam. They needed to have some fun. Um, they did find definitely a, a good amount of time for, for partying. Um, those who lived in the bigger cities were able to go to the theater, to the ballet and the opera. Um, in the summer, they went on picnics at the old noble estates um, and they even played baseball. And here's an example I found again in the uh, Hoover Institution archives. This was out in Simbirsk, a group of Americans playing baseball on our national holiday, 4th of July, 1922. Uh, and on the back of the photograph, it said, he throws a hot one. And you can see the catcher there just catching the ball as the pitchers released it. Uh, looks like they didn't swing on the, on the bad pitch. And what's interesting is if you look in the photo, 
Off to the far left, you'll see in white, uh, someone leaning on the fence, who I think is a Russian, probably trying to figure out just what it is these Americans here are up to. As I mentioned, there was a good deal of partying as well that went on. The Americans had their Victrolas sent over to put up in the personnel houses. There was a good deal of dancing, of fox trotting, um, Russian uh, women from the ballet in places like Moscow and Petrograd would come to these parties and dance. One of the wildest parties was held uh, Thanksgiving 1921 in Moscow when the dancer Isadora Duncan came through and entertained the Americans. And as you can imagine, there was a good deal of drinking. Much of this was brought on whenever the Americans had to meet with their Soviet counterparts, with the Soviet officials they were working with. And the Russians loved nothing better than to try to show these young Americans that there was no way they could hold their liquor on par with the Russians. Um, good deal of, of moonshine of Samagon was downed. There was one American who was given a glass of, of Samagon and said, quote, it looked like water, smelled like a mix of gin, three in one oil and kerosene. He still managed to drink it down, but he didn't dare light his pipe for several minutes after having had his drink. Now there was also a good deal of romance that went on between the Americans and the Russian women. Since most of the Americans who went over did not know a word of Russian and needed uh, people to work as translators, as interpreters, as office staff, they typically hired uh, young Russian women to do these jobs, many of them from the old uh, elite educated classes of Tsarist Russia. Uh, quite a number of them were daughters of the former nobility uh, former people. Uh, there was about 30 marriages that happened between the Americans and Russian women who are sometimes referred to as famine brides. And one of them involved this woman here, Georgina Dobrilkin Kokachova, who was another former person from a, a noble family in Petrograd who had lost everything during the revolution. And Georgina had been reduced to selling matches on the streets of Petrograd to put together just enough money to try to feed her and her mother in their small little apartment. When the Americans arrived, she was hired on as an interpreter since she spoke perfect English and French, having lived and studied before the revolution in Switzerland and in England. Now, she was working in Petrograd when an American by the name of Jay Reeves Childs walked in to the ARA office there. He saw Georgina and he writes later that it was love at first sight, at least it was for him. Childs who's uh, shown here sort of on the far right in the dark suit with the walking stick was from Virginia, uh, had gone to Harvard University and then served uh, in the ambulance and later in the intelligence corps in France during the first world war. Like many of the young American men who signed up for the ARA, he was he was really motivated in large part by a desire for adventure. He had dreams of becoming a writer and he thought going to Russia at this time would provide great material for a novel. But like many, he was also motivated by a sense of service, by a sense of duty to go off and try to help those less fortunate. Childs was one of the few, I would say, who actually sh shared a definite sympathy for the revolution of 1917. He was a proud socialist. He uh, voted for Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate in the presidential election of 1920. and was one of the, I'd say, true idealists uh, among the Americans who went over to Russia at the time. Now, when I set out to, to write the book and do the research, you know, it's, it's an enormous story, millions of people facing starvation and death over a vast territory. There are so many angles to try to capture, to, to tell the story and to bring it down to a personal level. So it's not just some sort of abstract uh, recitation of numbers and facts and figures and some things like that. So I decided early on that I would wanna find a few of the American men to use as vehicles to personalize the story and also to tell the story in a very concrete and immediate sort of way. So after a good deal of research, I landed on Childs as one of my characters and I, I came to call him my idealist. I then, ended up focusing on another man who I mentioned earlier, Frank Golder, uh, born in Tsarist Russia into a Jewish family, 
The family left Russia before the revolution as a result of anti-Semitic violence and ended up in the East Coast. Golder later also went on to Harvard and got a PhD in Russian history and then taught in Washington State before moving on to Stanford to teach Russian history there. I call him my realist because he understood the country and its people and language and culture better than, than anyone. I then found another fascinating, in my opinion, character, a man by the name of William Kelly, also from uh, the East Coast who went to Harvard. For some reason, the four men I ended up researching and focusing on all went to Harvard for some reason. Um, he had uh, served in World War I in France. In fact, even knew Jay Reeves Childs from his experiences in France during the war. Um, and then later after his service with the ARA, settled in New York City and had a long successful career as an uh, ad executive. He's my cynic. He wrote all of these letters back to his fiance in New York, um, full of sort of gallows humor and, and a deep dark uh, pessimism about Russia and its ability to move forward and get out of this crisis. And then finally, I, I selected a man by the name of Harold Fleming from Massachusetts, uh, who was my romantic, um, who went off not really sure what he would find in Russia, uh, but ended up falling in love with the country, mostly because he fell in love with two or three women while he was there and was sort of full of the romanticism of the whole operation. This was sort of not my plan when I set out to do this, that, that I would find these, these characters, but they were the ones who sort of left behind the most interesting paper trails of letters, memoirs, and diary accounts, and who'd also experienced the famine in different locations and at different times that allowed me to speak about what had happened from all sorts of different uh, perspectives. Now, I should say, I did not purposely leave women out of my research. The ARA did not hire women to go over to Russia, insisting that it was simply too dangerous for them, which is kind of interesting because other organizations, the International Red Cross and what have you, did send women over to Russia to work the family. But Hoover, in many ways, was a very conservative sort of figure and, and decided that American women simply would be put in harm's way. Um, it wasn't just women who were uh, denied work with the ARA. Jews were not hired. They were, it was believed that they would potentially become um, victims of anti-Semitic violence. And obviously, as you can imagine, other types of Americans such as black Americans were not hired for the obvious racial reasons we all know well today. But I did find uh, in the archives, this picture that really sort of brought me up when I was going through these hundreds and hundreds of photographs was this of a woman named Emma. Of course, they don't give her last name, typical of the racial system of the time in which Black folk were not referred to by their surnames. Um, and, and it says the ARA's wash lady. There were two photographs of her. Apparently, from what I could tell, she was in Moscow well before the Americans ever came over. And on the back of one of the photos, it says that she was married to uh, a Russian man and worked for the ARA uh, there in Moscow throughout the entire operation. But back to Childs. Childs arrived in Russia in September of 1921 and was sent to set up the office in Kazan, city of Kazan in the Tatar Republic, and immediately set to work. It was an enormous undertaking. There was something like four and a half million people in the Kazan territory, the Tatar territory that he had to oversee, 96,000 square miles. And he worked like most everybody, like a dog from basically 20 hours a day. The uh, offices for the area usually opened around 9 a.m. in the morning, pretty standard for Americans. Many of the Russians, however, were not really happy about that. There was one Russian who was hired to work in the American office until he heard that it opened at 9 a.m. And his response was, ah, yes, now I see how you capitalists exploit us Russians. And he turned the job down. Nonetheless, most of the Russians did enjoy the work. If nothing else, it gave them food. It gave them some money. It gave them an opportunity to feed their families and, sur and survive. Charles was one of the unlucky few who came down with typhus and had to be taken out of Russia to Berlin to recuperate. But what's amazing, even though he nearly died, he could not wait to get back to Russia. He wrote his mother at the time from his hospital bed in Germany, quote, I'm so anxious to get back to Berlin, to, to Kazan, anxious to get back to Kazan. 
The Russian experience is the richest that I've ever had. I wouldn't take anything for it. Now, much of this, I think, had to do with his, his growing love affair with Georgina. The two of them eventually married in St. Isaac's Cathedral in Petrograd, and she then moved down to Kazan to work alongside Childs in the office there in Kazan, and then they later left the country together when the mission was over. Now, in the span of just two years, the Americans and the ARA carried out what at the time was the greatest and largest humanitarian relief effort in history. At the peak, they were feeding almost 11 million people a day in 28,000 different cities, towns, and villages. They had shipped a million tons of food, seed, clothing, and medicine, distributed supplies to 15,000 hospitals, and they'd inoculated 10 million people against disease and saved what must be at least 10 million lives. Despite that, we don't know exactly how many people died, but it was probably somewhere on the order of 5 million people. But it wasn't just the food and the medicine that the Americans gave them. The Americans gave the Russians they came in contact with a sense of hope, a sense that tomorrow would be better. The archives are full of cards and letters and notes that the Russians wrote to the Americans before they left in 1923. And this is just one of them that I found, this hand-drawn, handwritten, quite large uh, letter that was from a group of mothers in Sevastopol to the Americans who had worked there dated March 14th, 1923. And the text there in the middle says, we, the women and mothers of Sevastopol's Southern District, overflowing with fervent gratitude, extend to you our sincere thanks for the help and concern you have extended to our children at this trying time. Tears of emotion pour from our eyes at the sight of how our children's faces that were pale and exhausted are once again fresh and healthy, thanks to the fraternal help of the Americans. Our children are happy, we mothers are joyous, and now have hope for the future. May the hearts who made this possible be forever blessed, and may the hand that gives always be full. On the 20th of July, 1923, the ARA closed its last feeding operation set up in Moscow and ended their operations and packed up to go home. Here's a group of four young Russian girls having a meal at that hermitage restaurant I mentioned that had become an ARA soup kitchen in Moscow. This is a picture of lunchtime in March of 1922. As the Americans were leaving, Gorky wrote another letter to Hoover, quote, in all the history of human suffering, I know of nothing more trying to the souls of men than the events through which the Russian people are passing. And in the history of humanitarianism, I know of no accomplishment which in terms of magnitude and generosity can be compared to the relief that you have accomplished. The generosity of the American people resuscitates the dream of fraternity among all people at a time when humanity greatly needs charity and compassion. Your help will be inscribed in history as a unique and gigantic accomplishment worthy of the greatest glory and will remain in the memory of millions of children whom you have saved from death. Gorky had been right. And in fact, 50 years later, in 1975, J. Reeves Childs decided to return to the Soviet Union, now an old man. He had continued his life of service working for the State Department throughout his entire life as a diplomat, including two stints as ambassador, once in Saudi Arabia and another time in Ethiopia. He remained married to Georgina until her death in 1964. When he arrived at the airport in Moscow in 1975, he told one of the people working there that he was an American who had first come over to Russia in the 1920s to work for the American Relief Administration. With that, the Russian man's eyes widened, his face lit up, and he whispered with reverence, A-R-A. -A. It's amazing, but even then, 50 years later, there were still many Russians who remembered American charity and we're grateful for what 
the ARA had done in 1921 to 1923. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure all the listeners are applauding virtually. Of course, we can't see them. It's one of the problems of doing virtual lectures. So it's just a tremendous uh, story. And the, the book um, was, I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. Uh, I spent, I think, two, <clears throat> two days without sleep <laughs> reading the book. Um, so before I introduce the panelists, um, I will mention that the way to ask questions when we get to the Q&A is that you have, a, you, you have a q and a function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that's the way to submit questions and then our moderator will read the questions. And now please welcome our panelists. Uh, Sofia Kishkovska is a well-known reporter based in Moscow since 1991 writing for the New York Times and the art newspaper on political and cultural issues. Nicholas Swichewski is the president of the Stalipin Center, uh, a nonprofit based in Moscow, and the publisher of Emigre Memoirs under the name of Transrosika. And Nadezhda Kitsenko is a professor of history at SUNY Albany and the author of A Prodigal Saint Father John of Kronstadt and the Russian people. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Um, thank you very much. Should I then start with the first question? Um, uh, Douglas, um, uh, thank you for the very fascinating lecture and, and, for, and for the book, which I think is just so important about um, this unjustly forgotten tragedy and the very complicated and heroic response to it. Um, I, I, in reading it, the book, I found very many interesting parallels to, to today and on various levels. Um, and um, I, I'd like to say immediately that my response to it is also um, based on the fact that for many years, um, working in the New York Times Bureau in Moscow, I, I spent hours a day watching state television and reading the state media. And so um, I, because they are really setting the tone for historical narrative in Russia, I'm very curious um, how you think it is possible for this story um, to, to get out in, in Russia. Um, because I, I think I've, I've looked through the, the state media and it's written about very rarely, if at all, there. Um, and um, um, I think we all know the kind of tone in which they, they talk about Russian-American relations right now, um, as we often see here as well. Um, at the same time, there is a grassroots response right now in Russia. There's um, a film um, that's being crowdfunded right now by a journalist named Alexander Arhangelsky, a journalist and writer who in fact had a show on, on state television for many years in the Kultura channel, but it's been canceled um, because the, the tone is changing again. Um, but this, um, interestingly enough, as I was looking up this film, I saw that there's an interview with him um, in the last few days in the Rasiska Gazeta, which is a, a Russian government sponsored newspaper. So um, I am curious to know, since you know Russia so well and do follow the, the current situation, um, will a historian's um, response to those events of, of many decades ago that are so important now, will you be able to, to, to get the story out in Russia? Uh, thanks, uh, Sonia. That's a good, that's a good question. I, you know, it's funny when I was um, uh, in Russia a couple years ago doing research for the book, and I was in, uh, in Moscow near uh, Patriarch's Ponds, and I I remembered that the 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 U.S. Uh, main building that they had used during the relief period was on Spiridonovka, which is just right there, and so I went to Spiridonovka Street and I found the building took some pictures of it. There's a picture of it in, in the book uh, as well. And I was happy to see it. And so I was staying with Russian friends at the time. And I said, 
you know, I found the building. I want to make a big uh, poster that says in Russian, do you know who lived here from 1921 to 1923 and why? And stand outside the building and see what kind of conversations I could have. Well, my friends looked at me and, and said, Douglas, that is a bad idea. <laughs> so, so I didn't do that. Um, obviously, most Russians uh, do not know anything about this story. What little they may know was that um, the Americans came over not to offer relief, but under the guise of relief, we're trying to foment counter-revolution, um, which was the narrative that was put out basically as soon as the Americans left. So I am happy to say though, um, that uh, the book is uh, being translated right now uh, and is gonna be published by a really excellent press in Moscow Corpus Publishers. Um, so it will be available in, to the Russian readers, uh, probably um, sometime late, uh, late next year. And I'll be curious to see what kind of reaction it gets. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, trolling that it's, you know, it's a lie. It's, a, you know, it's an American telling people how great America is, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely goes against what the established sort of uh, narrative is these days. And uh, I, I was also the other day watching, um, you, you must be familiar with Yuri Duit and the YouTube interviews that, that he does. And he he had um, uh, 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 an episode um, of it called um, Kalima um, a year or two ago that got 26 million views. And I was just thinking today watching one of his recent episodes that perhaps the way to counteract this now is he makes the program about the hunger, <laughs> the famine and the American response because he also had a program, um, an episode about Silicon Valley that had a huge response. Um, it had 22, maybe I'm reversing it. Maybe Kalima was 22 million and Silicon Valley was 26. But in any case, there, there are these new ways of getting out to, to the Russian public. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll be open for anything and I, I'll be curious what the, what the response is. And I, I, don't want, I don't want any of the readers, whether here or Russia or wherever, to, to think that with this book, what I'm trying to do is, is you know, beat our chests as Americans, because that's the last thing I wanted to do. Um, but what I wanted to try to strive was to, first of all, just sort of bring the story back up to some level of consciousness. I mean, there are academic books that have been written on it. There's a professor at Stanford who has written the sort of definitive work on the area in Russia um, called The Big Show in Bolo Land. Uh, Bertrand Patnaud's his name. But it's, it's 800 pages and very dense. And obviously, the average reader is not going to want to read 800 pages on this story. So what I try to do is write it in a way that'll speak to people. But I hope my goal with writing it, other than just to reintroduce it to some sort of general conversation, is to is to say let's all try to strive to you know listen to our better angels and and not to say look how wonderful America is, but but to say that you know even at the most difficult of times, countries can find ways to work together. Uh, people can find common purpose. Um, and uh, as I began the talk with, we always need more charity and compassion in our lives. We can never, we can never get too much of it. And this is an instance when I think, um, you know, those issues overrode political considerations and, and saved millions of lives. Thank you so much. So I'll continue on in that conversation. And Douglas, you're probably never going to forgive me for the <laughs> question that I'm about to ask. Uh, it's going to be very hard to uh, lay it out within this, this kind of framework or, or limit it within this kind of framework. But um, there's something about reading your books that always intrigues me. Uh, but I'm going to start with an old joke that I think most of you uh, know, anybody who's studied or read Russia. It's a joke that has uh, kind of been elevated to a guiding principle. 
that in Russia, there is nothing more unpredictable than our history. The fact is, when I started publishing books, it's been about uh, two years now, and I specifically started publishing memoirs, not because memoirs are an accurate history, but because memoirs provide a certain level of, of um, backfill uh, and a form of reality check uh, to much of what has been, uh, much of what is written. And I would say, and this may be a, a rather um, contentious statement, that Russia's never really had, uh, up until recent times, true history written. In uh, previous to 1917, previous to the revolution, history had a legitimizing uh, narrative, legitimizing the uh, symbolic power of the ruling class, of the aristocracy, of the tsar. Uh, but it was always more of a chronicle form than it was uh, history, notwithstanding Karamzin or Kluchevsky. Post-1917, uh, history was a creation myth of a new utopian society, uh, on the one hand, or a millenarian suicide cult on the other, hardly something you would call a history. Uh, this was now the not an effort to establish identity, which is what most history does. It was not seeking to uh, legitimize its authority. It was seeking control. It was the weaponization of history. And only in recent times are we starting to see with people like yourself, like Kotkin, like Sleskin, uh, like uh, one of my favorite Russian historians, uh, Mikhail Davidov, who wrote a fabulous book about the reforms of Vita and Stolypin. Uh, you're starting to see the emergence of a true history. Uh, the way history is supposed to be written by professional historians. And the reason I love your book so much, Douglas, uh, if you'll pardon the flattery, is that you're not just a historian, but sort of by example, you're creating, you're, you're setting forth a critique of history in the way history has been presented, specifically Russian history. And it's that aspect of critique I'm fascinated by. Um, so I would ask you the following question. And again, I apologize that it's, it's sort of deeply philosophical, et cetera, et cetera. But in view of the fact that we've gone from Legit, uh, the legitimization of power, to identity, to weaponization of history, to contemporary reality TV history. How do you, as a historian, specifically a Russian historian, how do you see the function of history today? Uh, and even more specifically, a function of Russian history to a Russian audience, right? Because the game has changed. We have new tools, we have a lot of new information that's becoming available. And so much of it we're seeing in your books. So how do you perceive the, the current function of history vis-a-vis -vis Russia today? Well, that's a, that's, that's a tough one. I think, and I, I'd love to hear what Nadia has to say, because she's more an expert in so much of this stuff and uh, especially like the historiography, she could speak too much better than I could. Um, I've, I've been doing it long enough that, you know, I first started going, learning Russian and going to Russia in the early 1980s. Um, and for a long time would go every year, sometimes two or three times a year. Um, and so I've seen all of the changes from, you know, pre-Gorbachev, Zastoy, stagnation to, you know, where we are today. Um, it doesn't give me any great hope um, for, uh, you know, where the country's going. And you, the two of you obviously know this uh, intimately better than I do, having lived there so long. Um, as, I, as I always say to people who ask me at cocktail parties and things about where Russia's heading, I said, well, it'll never be Denmark. Um, uh, so um, as far as the writing of history goes, I, I have very, very modest um, 
notions of whatever impact it's going to have in changing people's minds and ideas. Um, I really ultimately do it for very, very selfish reasons in that I just love it. And um, I'm happiest when I'm in an archive or in a library or reading or trying to put together a book or, or what have you. Um, and I hope that it'll come out in such a way that I'll be able to share um, with others the passion that I have, that it comes through on the, on the page. But I don't have much, I really don't have much hope that it's like a real tool for liberalizing Russian society or mm -hmm. um, changing, changing really how the vast majority of people are going to think about things. I just don't think I'll ever be able to compete with powers of television and, and the kind of things that, that are on the internet and that sort of thing. But I think it's maybe it's, I don't know, like a rear guard action of just trying to keep the flame burning um, that there are folks who are really interested in the truth um, and not in convenient um, stories that make us feel good about ourselves for whatever reason, but aren't, but aren't truthful. But I think Nadia could speak to that kind of thing much more eloquently than I could. Yeah, I was hoping to sort of it would segue also to a little bit what what I know Nigel was was going to talk about. I want to just add one thing that um, I found rather interesting about uh, trying to remember a year and a half ago. I taught a master's uh, program, a master's class at the Institute of uh, uh, U.S. Canada Institute in in Russia, and the subject was uh, the history of U.S. governance. But I was really startled by the students I had. There were 15 master's uh, level students and their level of objectivity and their global perspective was like something I had not seen previously. Now granted, this is a very small sampling of, of, a, of a broader population, but uh, these were kids who were globalists in every sense of the word, who are very web native. I mean, they grew up with the web. They understood uh, the power of the internet. And as global as they are, they were also very local. Their, their knowledge of, of national culture and national history, and dare I say, a re-emergence or perhaps emergence of an identity that I had not seen before, what I thought fascinating. In the midst of all the stuff that's happening with, you know, what I refer to as USSR 2.0, uh, there is this very powerful reemergence and why these histories, such as uh, what you are writing, have m a much bigger impact. It may be a small audience, but they have a really more powerful impact than you might think. Um, and I'm not sure it's about influencing so much as it is getting people to start thinking much more critically, not simply accepting um, you know, what Channel One is telling them. Uh, because, you know, the 20 year olds, they're not watching Channel One. <laughs> so, um, again, I, by example, what you're writing, I really appreciate it because it is coming across as a critique, even though you're not intending that uh, per se. So, anyway, that was my two bits. I mean, it is just briefly, I, it is interesting, like what people think they know, because. Uh, my book, Former People, about the, you know, the story of what happened to the nobility after 1917, my American publisher um, sold numerous uh, foreign rights, um, but they had no luck in the Russian market. And they said that every uh, editor at every publishing house in Moscow said, oh, we know that already. Yeah. We know that. And so it was, then later, you know, I met someone from another press there and they're like, we don't know this. So they did a Russian version of that book um, and it's now in its second or third printing. And it is nice, I, when I'm in Moscow, I'll be on the subway and I'll see someone reading the book in Russian and it makes me feel good to know that, okay, yeah. So it does get through, um, it, how many people, I don't know, but you're right. It's in anything that promotes critical thinking, be it in Russia or the United States or New Zealand is all good. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I feel that I have to stick up for the honor of Russian historiography <laughs> overall. 
<laughs> Nikolai, I hate to break it. I hate to break this to you, but there was quality history being written in the Russian Empire before 1917. There managed to be excellent history written in the Soviet period. Just to give only one example, Rubinstein wrote this amazing book about Russian historiography. So a survey of Russian approaches to writing about history. He published it in 1946, not exactly a time known for being a beacon of the free press, et cetera. And we still use it today as a work of real history. So I just, I mean, I can give you a list of any other number of works of so-called real history, but it's there and we do a great service to the tradition, to the Russian historiographical tradition if we neglect it. So, but we can, we, we can come back to that later, but to Douglas. Um, Douglas, you end your book with a famine, with talking briefly about a famine, which is perhaps rather better known, the 1932-33 Holodomor, um, which has become the cornerstone of Ukrainian memory culture and commemoration. And, I, I wonder in the story that you are trying to tell about your famine, is it possible that the reason that it's not better known is because like, not because anyone has been trying to keep it quiet, but because there's not a natural constituency for it. And I suppose my question to you would be, what do you think that historians can do in, um, in alerting people to something when there isn't an existing need in a sense. Um, because my old professor back at Harvard, Ned Keenan used to say in talking about the borrowing, the mutual borrowing of Muscovite culture and Tatar culture was cultures borrow what they need. Cultures commemorate what they need. So in effect, um, how do you create a need for reading about this famine? That is my question to you. Well, that's, a, I feel like I've just been found out. <laughs> um, there isn't, that's the, I mean, I think you're totally right. I mean, constituency is what you said. I mean, we know, what's interesting is, you know, America and other places, other countries and organizations went in in the 20s, invited in to help fight the famine. So you'd think that it would be better known because we know under Stalin, there was no international help coming in, right? Um, and not only that, they insisted there was no famine and did everything they could to hide it and cover it up. But yet it's the much better known of the two major Soviet famines. And I, to your point exactly, it's the Ukrainian community outside, uh, outside the Soviet Union that kept this story alive, that did all the research and really made sure that it rose to a certain level of larger uh, awareness. So they were the ones who really did that. In this instance, with the famine of the 20s, obviously the Soviet government did everything they could to play it down and hide it after it was over. Um, Hoover, uh, his reputation was destroyed after four years as an ineffectual president during the depression. And so you're exactly right. There was no group that was going to really stand up and make this story their own and insist that the world know about it. So I think that's you're you're exactly right that this is why it hasn't um, uh, been well remembered, neither in America nor nor in Russia. Um, and I um, I like to think that it will be a bit better remembered, but I I don't have. I don't think it probably will be because again, there isn't gonna be a group that's really going to push it. Um, and in fact, <laughs> when I was working on the book, I was in contact a lot with uh, librarians and archivists at the, the Hoover Presidential Library and Center in Iowa. And mm -hmm. they were very excited that I was writing this book. And they were like, you know, we're gonna put on all sorts of events when the book comes out and we're gonna publicize it and it's gonna be wonderful yada, yada, yada. So I, I sent them a galley of the book before it came out. Um, and in the book, I, I say some less than uh, flattering things about Hoover because as great a humanitarian as he was, he was human. 
and he was a product of his time and place. And he did a few things that were rather unsavory. And I didn't want this to be a hagiography. I wanted it to be history. So I, I mentioned those things. Yeah. Well, after I sent the galley to the people at the Hoover Presidential Library, I never heard back from them. And uh, I even emailed them to say, hey, how's it going? You know, love to come meet you and give a talk. And they completely broke off all communication with me. So um, I think, you know, other than us today, we're the only ones that will maybe keep this thing moving. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm, obviously we want to hear the Q&A, but um, I just wanted to say that I actually think that the thing that makes your book so distinctive and the reason that I think that it will work is because it's so well written. I mean, that, that, that you have such a great gallery of types. And as I was reading it, I kept thinking of Somerset Maugham and his, um, his account of Ashenden or the British agent in Soviet Russia at exactly this time. So. It's um, so I think I think there is a memory of it that can be tapped in on, but I think also that by virtue of telling these stories, I mean in effect by giving a gripping narrative, you are actually providing that new memory. So, well, well done. Thank well you. done. I originally, you know, I found out about this story when I was researching former people, and I was reading letters and accounts of of you know. So, uh, I think it was Sonia Bobrinska and some, some of the Galitsyns um, who got jobs for the ARA. And originally I thought this would be a great novel and I wanted to write it as a novel, as historical fiction. But then when I started realizing how gruesome it was and the level of horror, I, I quickly came to the conclusion that if I were to put these real events in a novel, people would think I was exaggerating. So I ended up sticking with conventional history. But thank you. And that's what it would actually make a great movie as well, um, made in, in the right way. I think it would be a wonderful movie and you could have, yeah. it's got, it's very almost sort of operatic and, and scope and yeah. scale and drama. Um, if, if I may um, uh, um, uh, just note, come back to a few things that you said and then um, returning to how this is addressed in, in, in Russia today. Um, uh, one interesting thing in that interview that I just found today in Resiska Gazeta about the uh, Alexander Arhangelsky movie about the hunger, the famine that he's making, it in fact is, covers both of them. He specifically says he's starting from the one that you have written about and going into collectivization. Um, but um, an, another point, and, and I think maybe this offers some hope for Russia is that um, when he's talking about, about um, 1919 to 1922, he said the driving force for that in his plans for the film was a local, well, maybe not a local journalist, but someone who had worked in Ufa and um, in Arenburg. And he said that the local memory there of this time and of the ARA lives on, and and it comes comes from that. And there's there is a sense right now in Russia with many things that are happening, that a lot of things are happening happening on the local level. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, there's much more crackdown at the higher level. So in terms of in terms of of history, um, uh, in in September, I believe it was the um, uh, Bastrikian, who is the head of the investigative committee, which is essentially the Russian equivalent of the FBI announced that they're forming a unit to fight falsification of history. And um, they will have investigators across the country whose job it will be to fight falsification of history. Now, there are already quite a few cases that have been written about by the, the foreign media um, about um, people who wrote not quite the right thing about the, the Second World War. That, of course, is their, their main focus. And um, it makes it very complicated for people writing about emigre history, about the about Roa, about the Vlasovce, and about moments like that. Um, so, you know, I'm wondering what your views are on the fact that it's in effect now dangerous to be a historian. And um, um, uh, at, at the same time, I was really curious about what to me seemed like parallels in the book to the current, the present day, and, and whether that's what you were thinking when you were writing it. For example, what you mentioned as well in the lecture about the help, um, the assistance given to scholars and to scientists. Well, that does sound like what the Open Society Foundation did in the 90s. 
and now that's illegal as well. Um, uh, they are in George Soros, anything connected with him and anything with foreign funding and such organizations, those are foreign agents. Um, and there are a lot of arguments, disputes about what they did in Russia, but it's hard to deny that they did a great deal. He, his organization did a great deal to, to save Russian scholars and scientists in that time. So did, was, was it interesting for you to, to, to learn about that? And, and, um, um, and so how, how do you think that aspect of it as well um, could be problematic for the way this time is portrayed in, in Russia since the whole question of foreign agents is just constantly repeated in the, in the Russian media. I can tell you from watching Russian state television for hours a day. <laughs> I, that's a great that's a great observation and and you're you're totally right um, because there's a whole theme to the book that I didn't go into in my talk because it just takes me too far afield but you know the United States did not recognize Soviet Russia until the Roosevelt administration in the early 30s and as these Americans are there working in Russia they all start to you know ask this question is like okay we're helping them right now in the short term but what should our long term relationship be with this place um, should we continue not to recognize them politically, have no diplomatic relations, or in fact, would it make more sense for us to recognize the Soviet government and really then engage in intense forms of exchange and cooperation, and in that way, modify their behavior, um, bro smooth off the rough extremist edges of, of the Communist Party, and it's and the Americans there get into debates among themselves. Some of them are like, you know, this place is hopeless. We need to just feed some people and then go home and let them figure it out. And then others, like the man named Haskell, who was the head of the operation there, was convinced with his meetings of top Soviet officials, including Lenin, um, that no, these people are open to working with us. And once they, and this is typical American hubris, once they see the way we do things well, they will immediately turn around 180 degrees and want to, you know, work like a mayor in a small town in Indiana or something like that. Um, and in a way, you could you could somewhat see echoes of that in discussions in the West about sort of who lost Russia post-Soviet period, right? Like, oh, we had this window of opportunity and the West somehow could have directed Russian development uh, so that, you know, we wouldn't have ended up with where we are today in the Putin regime. Um, this gets us way off topic, but you're exactly right. These are things that kind of percolate as well through the story that I tell. Just in two words, in my, my own personal opinion, I do not believe the United States or any other country has the power to shape Russia's de internal development. I think that's something they will do and can do and... Um, in fact, maybe there are times when the best thing that the United States or other people could do would be to butt out and not get involved. Um, but that's just my own personal opinion. I'm not a, an expert in current affairs, but that's what my reading of history and relations, that's what it leads me at least personally to believe. And what do you think about the dangers of being a historian now? If you if you want to talk about something connected to the Second World War, or, or what if after this you decided to write a book about Lend-Lease? Do you think that's possible? And you know, that's a good question. I don't think anything would happen to me. I was invited by um, some Russian journalists who had recently left Russia due to political reasons, or now working for. Radio Free Europe, Lady Liberty in Prague. And they read my book and they wanted to go to all these places in Russia and, you know, Ufa and Ardenburg and do a film about it. And I thought about it and I said, you know, I don't think I want to do that. Actually, my response is my next book's going to be on Vienna. How's that? <laughs> and that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, panelists, and thank you, Douglas, for, uh, for answering those questions. Uh, before we get into the q and I just want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that uh, I dropped a link into the chat. Uh, so if you, if you bring your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat. Uh, that's a link to our PayPal. So 
If you're interested in donating to the Russian Ability Association and specifically to the Prince Alexis Shcherbatov Scholarship Fund, uh, we would be grateful if you could do that. Any amount, $25, $50, uh, $100, uh, every dollar helps uh, fund that particular uh, effort. So, and now to the Q&A. Um, let's see, the first question we had, I think was a rather straightforward question. Uh, Douglas, how many Americans were involved with ARA uh, in Russia? So there was something like 380 Americans who worked for the ARA in the Russian operation. There was never more than 200 of them in country at any one time. And they often would rotate through. Um, typically they found out that they couldn't just send people over and leave them because literally it was so stressful that they needed to rotate people in and out. But it was never more than 200 at any one time. Okay, thank you. Uh, getting to the next question. Um, are you aware, and this is interesting because I believe Sonia just mentioned Len Lease. Uh, are you aware of any ARA veterans, uh, so to speak, who worked on the crucial Len Lease program 20 years later during World War II? Good question. I am not aware of any. Um, I actually didn't even think to explore that. Maybe I should have. I, I touch on lend lease in the book as another instance of international cooperation and aid, um, but I don't know if if any of the Americans who had gone over in the twenties were involved in the in the you know the, the World War II uh, lend lease period. That's a good question. I there's a future book. Right. Right. Um, okay. So a uh, question uh, just popped in and uh, also an interesting uh, point of view. What, why did the ARA program end in 1923? Uh, you know, was starvation, uh, was it over? That I go into in great detail in the book. There was a good deal of argument among the members of the ARA, especially the leaders, Hoover and others is, okay, how long do we stay? You know, um, there still was a good deal of hunger um, there wasn't mass starvation. And after two years, uh, the money was starting to run down. I think the, the, the political will to keep it going was starting to run down. Um, and they just sort of felt like it was time to pack it up. And the Soviet government was really getting tired of having these Americans around. And so they all just sort of decided, okay, this is it. And Hoover didn't want to get lured into some sort of operation that just went on year after year after year, like a quagmire kind of thing. Um, and so both sides decided it was time, time to, uh, to wrap it up. Okay. Um, someone, one of the uh, attendees mentions uh, that this is a story of American diplomacy. Uh, so the question is, have you sent a copy of your book to the Museum of Diplomacy at the Department of State? Uh, they believe that the book seems to be a natural choice for the American Corners libraries at US embassies and consulates in Russia. That's a great idea. I did not, I, um, I'd almost like to have that emailed to me. I should have thought about that or my publishers should have thought about it. Somebody should have, I didn't. Um, I have not done that, but uh, yeah, I think it would be a good book for, for you know, folks in the diplomatic corps to read, especially people going to, uh, to work in, in Russia, definitely. But if someone can email me how I do that, I'd be grateful. Okay, we'll make sure that you get the, uh, uh, that information. Um, did, uh, was there any assistance or did the Europeans organize any similar operations uh, to the ARA? There, there, um, there was European involvement. Um, I don't mention it in my talk because it's not sort of central uh, to the story, but 90% of all the aid, food and other aid that was brought over and distributed came from the ARA, came from the Americans. 10% was provided by a variety of European organization. The Norwegian Nansen, the famous explorer, humanitarian who won the Nobel Peace Prize, in part for his work on the famine relief in, 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 in Russia, he was also involved. Like his, the, the amount of food and aid he brought in, I think fed around a million people. Um, and then there were various Red Cross organizations. There were Mennonite organizations. Um, the Pope in Rome sent over some aid, but, but it wasn't, less that oh, the Europeans didn't care, they, they didn't want to help it, but it was more a, a function of the fact that, that Europe was still devastated uh, from World War I, and they just didn't have the capability and the capacity to give the kind of aid and help that the uh, Americans were doing. But I do make reference to some of these other relief groups. Okay. Um, 
What can you tell us about uh, the fate of some of the Russians who worked with the ARA, and particularly the women translators? Well, um, some of them, as I mentioned, uh, married uh, Americans and left. Uh, there was something like 30 marriages from what I, I've been able to uh, find out. For most people, they just sort of went back to their, went back to their daily lives, although there are instances of people who were uh, arrested as soon as the Americans left, were arrested and, and put in prison as American spies. Um, I don't know the exact numbers because this was all happening after the Americans left and so the Americans weren't able to keep track of it. But we do have information of numerous instances when this happened. And what's particularly chilling is it even was happening as late as the 1940s. So under Stalin during, during the war, uh, particularly I think in the Ukraine, they were rounding up uh, former uh, locals who had worked for the ARA during the war and putting them in prison as, as foreign agents and spies. But basically the, the Russians held a huge banquet for the Americans in the summer of 1923 in Moscow before the US left. And they showered praise on the Americans. They gave them ceremonial plaques and they had in fact named um, railways and highways and city corners after Hoover in Odessa and other cities. They had erected a monument to an American uh, in one town who had died of, of typhus. And you know, it was very much, we will never forget you. We will never forget what you Americans did and we will celebrate it and commemorate it for eternity. Well, it was about two hours after I think the US <laughs> men left from Riga uh, on their ships and everything was just turned off, wiped away. Everything was rewritten and swept under the rug. If you go and like read the, you know, the great Soviet encyclopedia, Bolshaya Sadeska Encyclopedia, it's all, whenever they write about the ARA, it's all that this was a, a manifest attempt by capitalist forces to overthrow the Soviet state that was stopped only thanks to the vigilance of the Chika. End of story. Right. Um, question regarding American uh, technology exchange programs. Are you acquainted with uh, any of these type of programs? For example, uh, the Henry Ford and the tractor factory in, in Kharkiv. I know very little about those. Um, uh, one thing I did read that was a fascinating book was about American um, Soviet economic cooperation in the 1920s. Because one of the things that interests me is those who were arguing at the time that the US should recognize the Soviet Union politically, that that would lead to greater trade and investment, which would help revive the Russian economy. Obviously that didn't happen till 33. And so I was always under the impression that, well, there was probably little trade and little borrowing and lending going on, but there's a, I forget the name of the book, but it's in my bibliography. Um, but a, a, a scholar studied all of this. And in fact, there was a good deal of growing trade, commerce and lending by major American banks and corporations throughout the 1920s. And so, you know, industrial plant was being developed, um, uh, equipment was being shipped over, factories were being erected. Um, and this goes to the point of like, can outsiders, the United States shape Russian development through trade? Trade was growing, cooperation, economic cooperation was growing throughout the 1920s. And then obviously we know what happened. Stalin comes to power and all of it basically ends, although there is some uh, still continued economic uh, development, heavy industry development. But basically, it did not modify Soviet development. It did not lead to um, uh, a moderation in politics. But obviously, we see like you know a, a revamping of the revolutionary spirit by the late 1920s. Okay, wonderful. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, and Douglas, this is actually a, a fairly uh, broad question, uh, but it's, it's directed specifically to you, uh, and that is. Um, one of our attendees wants to know if it's possible, what draws you to Russian history? What drew you there initially? I mean, is there a story behind it? You know, I wish I could say that uh, as a kid growing up in Minnesota that um, I picked up my first uh, work of Dostoevsky at the age of seven and fell into it and fell in love and 
uh, always dreamed of being Russian. Nah, I, nothing that romantic. I went off, I loved German uh, as a kid and took German in high school. And um, that was also not motivated by reading Goethe or Schiller, but I loved the TV show, Hogan's Heroes. Um, <laughs> I still actually kind of like it. Um, but so I went off to, to college in Vermont and to get my German major, I had to do another foreign language, at least to the intermediate level. And I didn't know what to take. And so at the University of Vermont, where I went to school, it was the Department of German and Russian for some reason. And so my German professor said, well, why don't you give Russian a try? And I had no interest. I said, well, fine, whatever, if I have to. Um, and this was 1981. So it was, you know, Cold War, the exotic uh, evil empire kind of thing. And I have to say, I. Um, I still have my first year Russian textbook, uh, Ben T. Clark, Russian for Americans. And from that very first lesson, the sounds, the strange letters, and, and the, you know, it was, it was the, the other superpower. And I was drawn into that. And, um, you know, I think some of us get the Russian bug, even though we have, I have no Russian family, I have no Russian connection, um, but I just kind of got hooked and, it's kind of been keeping me going ever since. Okay, you know, we just got one more question in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that. We still have a moment. Um, and the attendee, the, did the famine and general degradation of lifestyle begin in 1921, or were there uh, some origin or roots uh, going back to still the time of uh, Tsar Nicholas II and pre-revolutionary government? I I would argue, and I don't know, you know, the other panelists probably could speak to this just as well. I would argue that what happened in the early 1920s does not come out of the blue, that this is tied to um, deeper trends in Russian history and society. If you look back to the famine in 1891, and there was also this, this attempt even under the czars at the latter part of the 19th century to fund industrial development through the export of grain. And even if it meant there could be hardship and there could be suffering. We are gonna export because it's the only thing we have to make money that we can then use for industrialization other than straight out loans. But I don't know if, if Kolya or Sonia or Nadia, they have opinions on this. I'm sure they have you know, information as well. Yes, but that's a whole separate lecture. So I think, I think we'll go with what Douglas said and let it go at that. <laughs> okay, well, it's always good to, uh, to have ideas for other lectures. It's, uh, it's good to keep the content uh, flowing. Uh, so that concludes the Q&A for today. Uh, I would like to uh, do several things. First of all, I would like to remind everyone of the, the link in the chat window. Uh, that's a donation link. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not remind everybody uh, that your donations go a long way to helping us achieve uh, our goals at the Russian Nobility Association. Uh, there will be another webinar in two weeks on December 5th. Uh, please watch the email inbox for uh, notifications and information regarding that uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to thank Douglas Smith. I would like to thank our panelists, Sonia, Nadja, and Nikolai. Uh, and most importantly, I would like to thank everyone uh, for asking their questions and for attending today. Uh, without you, this would not be possible. So with that, I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, before I go, Douglas has his finger. Sorry. Douglas, please. Sorry, I just want to say one final thing, because I'm not sure if everyone got, I was able to answer every question. People can go to my website, which is just douglassmith.info, douglassmith.info, and you can send me messages. Um, you can send me an email. So if I didn't answer your question or if what I said didn't make sense um, and you want follow-up, please feel free to email me. Wonderful. Once again, thank you very much and wish you all a pleasant day. Thanks.